Hello, everyone, and welcome to After School Animal Encounters, the motion episode. My name is Ryan, and I am the lead visitor services representative at the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. And boy, oh boy, is that a title. And I will be your co-host today, along with my friend Javier, who is an educator with the Harvard Museum of Natural History and is standing by with some super amazing animals to show you. At certain points of the presentation, we will be switching between different camera views. So don't worry if the feed changes at times, we're just trying to give you the best views of the animals as possible. All right, now that we have all that boring stuff taken care of, are you all ready to see some super cool animals? Javier, are you and the animals ready? Hey Ryan. Hey Javier, how's it going today? Not too bad, how are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm excited to see some really neat animals. Me too. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm coming at you live from Classroom B here at the museum. And I'm super excited that you're all joining us because we're going to be talking about animal movement, right? And animals move in all sorts of different kinds of ways. So today we are going to take a couple animals from here in the museum and really get up close and just learn about how exactly they move and what they use to move. So why don't we get started here? And I'm going to share my screen. Oh, whoa. Well, Javier, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, but it looks like, are there hundreds of little feet going on here? That's a great way of putting it, Ryan. So what we're looking at right now is the underside of a sea star, right? And again, we might think of sea stars as kind of just staying put. We might find them in a tidal pool uh, or someplace like that along the shore. And we don't see them really crawling around, but they are in fact crawling around. They just move at an incredibly slow rate question is really, how are they doing that? So that's why I thought it'd be great if we got a close view here of the underside where you're seeing all these hundreds of little feet, as you mentioned, which are basically little suction cups, right? So you can see that it's attached to the side of the tank right over here, and the rest of them are kind of moving about. And slowly but surely, it is moving along. All these little suction cups are basically helping the sea star walk along the surface of the tank. Isn't that cool? Oh, that's super cool. And if you really pay attention and look, you can see lots of individual ones, but it's fun to kind of stare at one for a while and watch it sway back and forth and try to grip stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see how, like I said, they're attached over here at the end. The top ones over here are looking for anything. And it is just kind of moving along. I've had this sea star in the tank for about 20 minutes now. And it's really moved from one side to the other. But because I'm a super impatient guy and I don't really want to just sit here and watch it move ever so slowly, I thought it'd be a great idea if we could watch a quick little video I made of some of our sea stars in our marine tank here and see how they're moving about. So let me see if I can just get us going here. Can you see my tank, Ryan? Oh yeah, it's a great shot of the marine tank there at the museum. Cool, so here is the marine tank in our classroom. We are going to notice that we've got uh, our horseshoe crabs and you're gonna notice there is a spider crab and a sea urchin. So those will all be moving pretty much, you know, as you expect uh, these animals to move. But I really want you to focus on our sea stars, right? Cause every now and again, they'll decide, you know what? They're not happy where they are. They just wanna move to another part of the tank. And this is when we really get a sense of the fact that they are in fact using those little two feet to move. So here we go. We're gonna notice them going around. And again, you'll see how all the other arthropods the horseshoe crabs and the spider crab are really zipping by fast. That gives you a good sense of how slowly they're moving and compared to all the other animals in the tank. Absolutely. Oh, so they're like, you right know what? Across. Yeah, I want to be over here in the corner. I'm content. Oh, wait, no, I'm not. I'm going to move over there. And they're essentially just hanging out, looking for some clams to eat because that's what they do. Very cool. It's really neat to see them moving around like that because animals sometimes like the sea star can move so slowly. You get lulled into the sense of that they're not moving at all. But it's, if you just stare at it long enough, or if you're fortunate enough to have a time lapse video, you can really see them trucking around. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So it's great to actually see them in action and all those little two feet, as I mentioned, moving around. They're pretty neat to observe up close. 
So oh, this yeah. next yeah. animal here is one that we featured in the past as well. And when we show it in the tank, um, just up here that I'm going to show you now, I'm going to share my screen so we can see it. Uh, it doesn't look that exciting. This is going to be a type of sea snail called a whelk. Let me show you what I'm talking about. It's not exactly super nifty to look at. Let's see what we've got. Because now these types of animals, I get to see in tide pools all the time, but oh, there's something coming right out of the bottom of the shell. This is great because as much as I'm in tide pools and as much as you see these shells around, you never really get a good sense or you get to see that animal inside the shell. Yeah, absolutely. And man, perfect timing. Our well here has decided to actually do some moving. Looks like it's finally coming out of its shell. Could not have hoped for a better a little bit of movement, but the question is how exactly is it moving, right? So if we just talked about our sea star having hundreds of hundreds of little, little tube feet, this animal, this sea snail here, the, um, the whelk, is using one big foot. What? what do I mean by that? Well, that underside that you see right over there, that is something known as a muscular foot. And if you notice the edges, you see how they're kind of like rippled a little bit? Just oh, yeah, of, yeah. So what this does is it actually moves with this kind of like wave-like muscle contractions, and the whelk uses that muscle, uh, muscular foot to actually propel itself. And what it does is as it moves along, it puts down this really thin layer of slime known as mucus. And this not only protects the snail, but it also makes any surface that is on extra slippery, so it can really glide along. So while that was cool, I'm not going to lie. I thought I was just going to kind of sit there in the tank. That was pretty cool to watch it turn over. Oh, yeah. It's a big deal for us here. <laughs> right? Uh, I thought it'd be cooler to really watch in action. So there's one thing that I've noticed about our particular whelks here at the museum. They're not very active during the day, interestingly enough. Uh, but if it's ever kind of a little bit darker, I tend to notice that they are moving around in the tank a little bit more. So I happen to have a video here that I took of our dog whelk really in action. And we can really tell just how amazing this one big muscular foot allows the snail to move along this incredibly kind of different terrain at the bottom of the tank. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, you oh, see wow. that, Ryan? Oh yeah, right off the bat, you can see almost pretty much all of its body out of the shell there. All right, so here we go. Watching this guy glide. Oh, you're right though. It has such a beautiful wave motion as it moves. And in a moment here, you'll see that the, oh, there it goes. The muscular foot is kind of going up against the edge of the glass. So you can get a real sense of what the bottom of it looks like as well. Oh yeah, all soft and white. So it's going to, go ahead. go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say you definitely need that mucus support because it doesn't look like it's the toughest animal in the world. But yep. it's, you're telling us that it has that extra mucus layer that supports it underneath. Yeah, absolutely. Having that mucus layer really makes sure that it creates that slick surface that it needs. Now, also, also offers a real layer of protection as well. A snail can actually glide over or crawl right over a knife's edge completely unharmed thanks to that mucus layer. That's cool. impressive. Watching it do its thing. Goes right over that other shell. And you can see some of the little pieces of, um, of sand at the very top there. They see, appear to be stuck to some of that mucus that we were referencing earlier. Oh, yeah. Oh, and real quick, Javier. Now, is this in stop motion or time lapse, I should say? No. Or is this how fast this guy moves? It's a great question. That is actually real time. So that is oh, how okay. fast that snail is going. So definitely faster than our sea star just early, but still fairly slow, right? Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Ryan, because you know when I think of snails, I tend to think of things that are slow, right? I tend to think of them as slow animals. Most snails are slow. But if I had to really name a faster snail, turns out there is one species out on the Pacific coast along the shore called a plow snail, and they use their muscular foot in a very different way. While they still can use it to create that slime layer and glide along the sand when they're on the shore, on the beaches, they can also do something really, really unique that makes them 
quite special in the snail world. What they can do is they can extend out and flatten that muscular foot. And then when a wave comes by, they actually use it as a sail and it catches that wave. It can actually zip along at some pretty fast speed. So if you got a chance later and you've got some adults to help you, I definitely recommend Googling surfing snails or plow snails because it's fun to watch them go so fast. It sounds like you're almost describing like a like a windsurfing snail. Like, you know, you get a human on a surfboard and you get a sail and you can move. But if you've got your own apparatus attached to your body, you don't even need a windsurfing. Yeah, that's exactly <clears throat> right. Truck so along. If we talked about, you know, our sea star here, that's slow. And then our snail, that's a little bit faster, but still slow. Okay. Let's keep on going with this theme of slowly but surely getting a little bit faster. So I'm gonna go on to another slow animal that's famously slow, but maybe a little bit faster than a snail. And it's an animal that we have featured a lot here on After School Animal Encounters because she is so beloved to us. And that is of course our beautiful Eastern box turtle. Isn't she adorable? I just she's love having her out. Let's see if she'll do any walking for us right now. <clears throat> I'm gonna pop the camera down. She's usually so spry in a lot of our other programs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whenever we want her to stay still, she never does. But now that we're like, hey, would you mind walking for us a little bit? No, I'm just gonna hang tight. Cool. Cool beans. This is why we have some additional footage to show you guys because absolutely. But I do think it's hilarious, Javier. Every time we want her to stay still. She's trying to squirm away from you and just booking it. And now we just want her to walk a little bit. And she's like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, of course. They've got a mind of their own and they love to embarrass us. But that's okay because we caught ship, you know, walking earlier. And we're going to show that. So the cool thing to think about turtles is, you know, why are they so slow, right? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one is they don't really have to chase down their food, right? Turtles are mostly herbivores. They're omnivores in reality, right? They'll eat a bunch of different stuff. But for the most part, she really loves her greens, especially her kale here. And she's not having to chase down her kale anytime soon. It's presented to her. So she doesn't have to do that. Uh, apart from the occasional bug, her food is pretty much always going to be readily available, right? She's really not having to move too fast for that. Um, the second reason that turtles are fairly slow, especially our box turtle here specifically, is because, you know, uh, she doesn't have to avoid predators either, right? If she ever gets presented with a hungry fox or a raccoon or some kind of predator that would love to make a meal out of her, what does she do? As we talked about before, she tucks her head and all her limbs inside her shell, right? So again, no reason to have to run away or be really fast. Now, while that's a great advantage, right? Having this incredible shell to serve as both a home and a sense of protection, um, a form of defense, it can definitely be a little bit cumbersome, right? It can be pretty heavy and slows the turtle down overall. Yeah, I can kind of like, you know, you can run pretty quick if you're wearing just like athletic clothing, but then imagine you put on a suit of armor or something and it's gonna be really heavy. Oh, looks like she's gonna wanna, there we go. Do it. Uh-huh. Oh. Well, that's we great. Sea star moving a little slow. Dog walk a little faster. It, it's funny to think the turtle's even faster. I know. Let's watch a, a quick little clip I took here earlier of the turtle really hauling. So Fantastic. I'm going to get this going up here. So this is, our, this is our going. turtle at full speed. This is pretty much as fast as she goes. So let's see here. There she goes. Notice how she walks on her her toes there, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, a cheetah's got nothing on our turtle here. That is just record-breaking right? speed. Slow but steady. Very little angle here, watching her look in action. Really good sturdy stepper, it looks like there. Really yeah. sure-footed. You know, another thing to think about with um, Eastern box turtles specifically, too, is that they don't have to travel very far. Um, Eastern box turtles can spend their whole entire life within a one mile radius, right? They have a home range, so they're not exactly moving great distances. So, again, they don't have to be super duper fast. Yeah, and as far as turtles go, the Eastern box turtle, this species is out there, uh, rather an energetic walker, and they can actually make about 50 yards a day 
And for those of you at home who are thinking, what's 50 yards? Half of a football field is 50 yards. So just imagine that little, little uh, turtle there trying to slowly walk half of a football field, which is huge for an animal that tiny. Pretty impressive, right? Um, Very impressive. And just because we talked about those snails moving fast, I was wondering today and really thinking about what kind of turtles could we talk about that uh, are a little bit on the faster side too, right? We all know that some turtles are pretty uh, adept swimmers. You know, they can definitely get some speed when they're in the water, but there's one particular kind of turtle that I think is really worth mentioning. If you're not familiar with it, it's called a soft shell turtle. It's got a flatter shell. It doesn't have this big rounded um, dome uh, shell like our Eastern box turtle does. And what's cool about it is it's a really fast swimmer. It can really really, really uh, move fast in the water, but it's also fairly quick on land as well. And there's some great videos online of these turtles along the banks of ponds, and then people get a little bit too close, they get startled, and they just bang, take off like a shot. And I've been lucky enough to go swimming in rivers in Texas. And when I was in the river and you kind of like, you know, you're always looking for the sides for fun animals around whenever you're in neat places. We, me and my friends, we saw a soft shell turtle and then someone made it like a little stir or a noise. And before I could, I was like, oh, it's a turtle. It'll move slowly, whatever. It, you're right. It was in the water in like not even seconds. It just kind of all of a sudden was in there with us. It's so, crazy. Yeah. You don't think of turtles moving fast, but some of them definitely can. So let's see. We talked about our sea star. We talked about our whelk here. Moved on to our turtle. Why don't we move on mm. to a, another animal? So I'm just going to set up my next shot here, Ryan. Give me one moment. Right. So while Javier's doing that, we started with hundreds of feet. And then we did one giant foot. And then we did four feet moving slowly. So I'm curious to see what style of movement and how many feet and what the next animal is going to do. I right. do have to give special props to Javier because as you can see, not only is he presenting you with all of these great facts, he's actually simultaneously wrangling every animal that we get to watch here today. So big round of applause for Javier and his animal wrangling abilities today. Let's do what we can. So this next animal here, I am going to share via my cam because it's a little shy. It's a little skittish. Um, so I want to make sure that I don't disturb him. Uh, let me get my camera ready to go here. Ooh, exciting. See what it is. All right. So you oh, see that okay? Oh, yeah. I'm looking at a really cute frog taking a bath, it looks like. So everyone say hello. Oop, let me get a little bit of focus here going. To our juvenile... African bullfrog, also known as a pixie frog. Quite small, of course. And when we think about frogs, we think about them being amazing or excellent jumpers, right? So frogs use this ability both to catch their prey and avoid becoming prey, right? Avoiding predators altogether. And it may come as no surprise, but the real secret to frogs jumping abilities are those powerful, strong hind legs, right? That's where they get mm -hmm. all that strength to really leap themselves forward. And it's not just the muscles in those legs. It's actually the tendons as well, right? They're very elastic. They're very springy. And in folding those legs and then jumping forward, they get a burst of energy where they can really propel themselves pretty far. Oh, yeah. And for those of you at home that might be sort of unfamiliar with what a tendon or how that works, a good way to think about it maybe is, you know, if you've got like a bow for bow and arrows and it's straight, but then you pull it all the way back and it gets really tight and you let go, and it springs forward super fast. That's kind of like the concept that the, the frogs have in their legs. It takes those tendons and it gets them and it gets them and it gets them and it just shoots all of that energy out in a super quick movement. Totally. So frogs can leap, you know, especially like the kinds of frogs that really specialize in jumping. Uh, they can leap way farther than their body distance, way higher than their actual height. And to get a sense of what that's like, I, of course, have a quick little video here that I want to share with us. So let's watch the frog in action. So here we go. And before I hit play on here, all right, everybody see the video of the frog on the screen? Oh, yeah, got a little frog in the cool. corner there. So I want you to think about how 
about here is the frog's height, right? If we drew an imaginary line across the frog, you see yeah. my cursor moving? So watch the frog jump, and I want you to think about how high, all right, it gets relative to its body size and how far it is. So if this is one frog, let's say this is two frogs, this is three frogs, four frogs, etc. So here we go. Let's hit play and watch it go. Whoa. It's pretty far. Off screen. Yeah. He's going back and he's going off. Off again. It's interpretive. That's pretty impressive, right? He can really launch itself. Yeah, he can. You can see those back Ooh. legs lunge. You see there? Oh, that predatory Target lunge there. Yep. Oh, yeah. Doing a munch on some crickets. I'm going to play that again, especially that first video here. That cause... first jump is incredible. Yeah, like you said, it jumps completely off screen. So you'd imagine maybe it's going to jump right around over here. But no, it jumps way farther. And that's what? One, two, three, four, at least five times its body length? Come on. That's impressive for a little guy like that. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Let's watch again. Boom. Amazing. I mean, for me, uh, uh, for those at home, because you can't really tell, but I'm about five foot seven. So five times my body length would be over 25 feet. I can't even imagine coming close to making that amount of distance in one jump. I could maybe four, five. I don't know. I haven't tried in a while, but not 25 plus. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and you and I, Ryan, earlier were talking about how in California, they have a local county fair where I believe every year they have a frog jumping contest which is pretty cool when you think about it. So um, awesome. I also want to point out that, you know, we tend to think of frogs as excellent jumpers, but not all frogs are really built for being amazing jumpers. Think about toads, right? Toads typically move around with small little hops. Um, some frogs are really better built for digging or for burrowing. Some dog, uh, dogs, some frogs really have, um, uh, specialized toe pads for climbing and they spend their whole entire li um, lives up in the trees. So while we think of frogs as being excellent jumpers, not all frogs are really that great at it. Only well, certain species are the all-stars of the frog jumping world. Exactly. Absolutely. I think the record at the county fair contest that we talked about earlier is an American bullfrog. So really great jumper there. Yeah. So let's keep it on moving. Um, we talked about a lot of different kinds of legs. We talked about some feet, right? The two feet. We talked about the muscular foot. Let's go on to an animal that has no feet of all, no limbs at all, right? You probably know what I'm talking about. Let's meet our Mexican milk snake and think Ooh. a little bit about how snakes move, all right? So I'm going to bring out our this. snake right here. So how exactly do snakes move without any limbs, right? They've got no limbs at all, but we know they definitely get around quite easily. So what they really do is they use their flexible bodies and their belly scales, right, to help them push along. And the most famous way for a snake to move is known as serpentine motion. What do I mean by serpentine motion? Well, that's basically when a snake contorts its body in an S shape, right? You were doing this before earlier with me, Ryan, right? You can see it actually doing this oh, kind yeah. of movement. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, by pushing itself side to side, it actually pushes off the ground and propels itself forward. Right now on my hand, I can actually feel the snake's muscles contracting and really pushing off my hands as well but it's hard to really appreciate how the snake moves just by holding it up to the camera like this. Um, so we're gonna watch a quick little video of the snake in action. Now, because the snake has got pretty smooth belly scales over here, it really moves best when it can be on a surface that has some kind of traction, right? Some kind of a rough surface where it can really easily push itself off of. So if you put the snake on a smooth surface like glass, for example, it's gonna have a bit of a tough time actually getting anywhere. But let's see a quick little video here and we can get a better sense of what that's like. So I'm gonna pop our snake back over here in the meantime. Thank you. Yeah. As Javier is putting away our snake friend there, I will also attest to 
uh, how it feels when it's on you. I was, uh, I used to work at another museum and I was lucky enough to do a lot of creature features with a big uh, ball python and you get it wrapped around you and you'd walk around. But like Javier saying, you can feel it moving. It almost pinches little parts of you as it kind of uses you as its grip to move around. Almost tickling you, but it's a really neat feeling. So do we see my screen here with my oh, yeah. snake? Cool. I got a snake so right on. It's on a white sheet here, but the sheet is fairly slick. So we'll see the snake definitely doing that serpentine motion that we talked about. But we're not going to see it really moving forward a lot, but that actually helps us because it really enables us to get this great wide angle shot of the snake doing that motion that we were discussing. So mm -hmm. let's check it out real quick here. And you usually see snakes doing this type of motion. Like Javier said, they're on a sheet right now, but you know they might not be coming across sheets that often in the wild. But think of maybe a sand dune or a beach or something that really doesn't have a, a good grip surface. So you can see the ones in the deserts doing these and they leave those neat little S-shaped patterns behind them. Yeah, you can really look to that. You see those curves. Oh yeah, really rippling go. away. So this next little clip here, we're gonna speed up the snake just a little bit more to really get a great view of that. Oh, real cool. And you can see how it's trying to get ahead, but it's just a little bit too slick. It's getting there slowly but surely, but it's definitely a bit of a struggle. It reminds me a little tiny bit of the dog whelks movement. And it has that kind of wave, waviness to it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way, a great comparison. Uh, so we've got one last animal to go over here. And this is an animal that definitely is going to have legs. It's going to have way more than the average animal. Unless you are an arachnid, then you've got just the right amount. And let's see if we can bring it out here real quick. Come on, baby. So here we have our rosy builds. Our rosy Chilean tarantula. Oh, there it is. Ooh, and it is definitely not taking a cue from the turtle, and it is moving up a storm right now. Yeah, this tarantula got the memo, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, you need me to make some movement? Got you. I got you. You're like, take notes, turtle. Yeah, and a lot of people really feel that, oh my gosh, it's so creepy the way it moves. But in reality, they're really gentle steppers. Mm. See how carefully she places each one of those little steps. She's got fuzzy little claws at the end of each leg, which actually tickle a little bit. I can imagine. It looks like it would tickle. Yeah. You get a good view of her right there. Oh, yeah. You can watch each one of those legs. She's got a couple up in the air at the same time. And she's got a couple on the ground or on your hand, I should say, at the same time. So she looks pretty sturdy. Yep. So let's put her back. I'm going to watch a quick little video and get a better sense of what her movements are like. Oh, great. I was hoping we get a video of the tarantula, too, because they have such an interesting and different way to move about than us humans and other mammals at times. So it's always fun to see things that are very different from you. Right. All right, so let's get a close-up view here of the tarantula's walk. Oh, yeah, just like you were saying. There's always a couple of legs on the ground and always a couple moving around. Very small, careful steps, though, because I've heard they don't have great eyesight, so they're not darting out at times. They're really feeling out their environments and making sure everything's okay before they continue any further. Yep, absolutely. They're using all those little sensory hairs along their body, picking up on vibrations, right? So they're walking ever so carefully. And as you mentioned, there, there is a general rule of thumb where typically you'll have four legs on the ground, four legs in the air, but it's not a very specific pattern. It's, it's a very general rule of thumb. So in this next little clip here, we're rewinding and watching from the top. You can see some of those in action, but it's not exact right there's a little bit of variability sometimes she'll lift one a little bit sooner and pop it down you can see how the two will lift typically in the se in a sequence oh yeah yeah right in the middle every once in a while it's 
two up, two down, two up, two down. And there she goes. Super cool. So, Ryan, those are all the animals we have for you today. I hope everybody enjoyed them. And I think it'd be a great time to answer some questions. Fantastic. Well, it looks like we are reaching the end of this portion. And not only are we reaching the end of the portion, Javier, you, you are right on the money with time there. That was fantastic. Nice. Uh, and thank you again for all of those videos and filming them all. I know not just the people at home, but I had a really great time watching all of those animals in those short videos and how they can move around. Uh, just really great stuff. So, but it looks like we do have a ton of great questions. So before we get to them, I just wanted to thank all of y'all for joining us today and having fun while we got to know some amazing animals. If you enjoyed this event and are curious about more great online content, be sure to check out HMSC Connects, where you can listen to podcasts, do cool activities, and get a weekly e-newsletter with even more great content. Now it's on to the questions. All right. Let me get back here and see. <clears throat> I'm going to start all the way from the beginning. Now we're going to see if there are some super interesting questions that we have here. Ooh. All right, I'm going to start us off with a, with, a, with a pretty good one here, Javier. Go for it. How many legs does our sea star have? Oh, great question. So total of five legs, right? You know, think about classic star-shaped, but then it's got all those hundreds of little tube feet, right? So even though it's moving those legs, it's little tube feet, the little suction cups along the legs. They're really doing all the work. Yeah, oh, great. Okay. So we've got another one. I'll stick with a couple about the dog whelk here. I have, I'm going to have to go ahead and just pause my favorite question right off the bat because it starts with, cool. Is the mucus more slippery or viscous? viscous? Sorry. My gosh, what a great question. And I do not know the answer, but it sounds like we've got a science experiment that someone needs to do ASAP and get back to us, right? Because that's a great question. I'm not sure how you would set that up, but once you have an answer, definitely follow up with us. Cause I, I now I want to know, is it slipperier right? or more viscous? Good question. See, these are always those fun things for educators and people who love animals like me and Javier. You usually end up learning based off of all the great questions you get, because there's so much information out there to know about so many different animals. And when you get questions you can't answer, it's actually my favorite, because then I know I've got to go and research it and I get to learn new stuff myself. Totally, I 100% right. agree. Ooh, so I've got a question for you, Javier. Here's a, little, here's a little bit of your animal husbandry taking care of the animals question. How do you specifically take care of the box turtle? Great question. So how do we take care of our box turtle? Well, number one, we check on her every single day, right? Mm -hmm. So not a day goes by that we don't check on her. Uh, she gets fed regularly. She gets a hefty mix of kale, as I mentioned. She gets apples. Uh, what else does she get? She gets grapes, which she really loves. And that's all gets chopped together in a little turtle salad. Um, and then of course she also gets crickets and mealworms as well uh, to supplement that. Um, and then we really just make sure that she's got all the right conditions here at the museum that she would have outdoors, right? That means the humidity levels, that means the right amount of heat and just having a careful eye to make sure that she's always doing okay. Very cool. Yeah, it sounds like it's a very well taken care of turtle there. So, all right. Ooh, someone was curious about the foot of the dog whelk, and they kind of saw a little bit underneath, but they were asking, is it more yellowish or more whitish? Man, I don't know exactly. I guess that's a little subjective, right? But mm. I definitely noticed that it was lighter, right? Uh, that's something you can really see before. So let's watch that video again real clip here. Oh, yes, yeah, so we can all see, let's see. Yeah, why not, right? We've got it available. So let's go back to it. Do, do, do. So if I go back a little bit, you see that, right? Oh, yeah. Looks yeah. pretty white to me. It's but, 
Yeah, I don't even know what I would call that color, but I think what's important to note here and what somebody's observing, and I, I appreciate that observation so much, is that it is a completely different color, right? So mm. it looks like there's something that makes the underside of that muscular foot unique or different than the top side. Perhaps that's you know what really enables it to kind of release all that slime, that mucus we were talking about. So I, I don't know what you'd call it more on the white side or more on the yellow side, but I do definitely agree that it's a different color. Absolutely. Well, maybe we'll, we'll have to get someone on the art museum on the phone about that color question. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not a color expert. Ooh, here's a fun one. Do you know if tarantulas can walk backwards? Ooh, uh, well, if you're referencing that video that we saw earlier, that mm. definitely was just to illustrate how that movement would look backwards, right? Quick little rewind. So um, that wasn't them actually walking backwards, but I don't see why not, right? I'm thinking about the times I've kind of handled our tarantula and maybe seen them back into a corner a little bit. I don't think that that's something they would regularly do, like, you know, move all the way backwards, but I don't think there's anything inhibiting them or keeping them from taking some steps back. Does that make sense? Absolutely. All right, let's see. We've got actually some pretty good ones. Oh, here's a really good one that I used to get all the time when I would uh, do snake presentations. Do snakes have bones? Oh man, great question. And I often get that question as well. And I always appreciate people asking it, right? Because it means that they're not sure they really want to learn about it better. And snakes are vertebrates, right? So they definitely do have bones. Uh, interestingly enough, they come from a group of animals that once upon a time did have limbs, right? And we know that because there's different clues in snakes that tell us that once upon a time they also had legs. But for the most part, snakes that we know about now are just one long backbone and lots and lots and lots of ribs. Very cool. Yeah. And even when you have them, you can feel that it has bones. Like there's some sturdiness to it uh, when, when you have a snake in your hands there. All right. So, oh, I've got a pretty good one that some people, I think, will help them with this spider. Someone was asking, is the tarantula scared of us? If it had a, if, it, yeah, is the tarantula scared of people? And is that why it's a bit skittish at times? And I think this is a good question for some people at home that might be scared of other animals without realizing that maybe those animals are a little scared of us because we're so big. Great question. And, you know, our tarantulas here at the museum are fairly used to being handled. You know, we're incredibly gentle with them. We've got a lot of experience holding them and holding them correctly so they feel supported and not kind of, a, you know, in a place where it makes them uncomfortable. So I haven't ever had the tarantula, you know, rear its fangs at me or do anything that would make me think that it's scared or uncomfortable. So I'd like to suggest that our tarantulas here are fairly used to us educators at the museum working with them, but like any animal, especially wild animals, right? I, I can see a situation where a person, which is really big compared to a tarantula, especially getting really close to an animal like that, can absolutely scare a tarantula. So I'm gonna say ours, not so much, out in the wild, probably. Fantastic. That's a good, good to know. People are always a little timid of a lot of animals. And most of the time that animal is probably a lot more scared of you in the wild than you are of it. Cool. In that same frame, Javier, I've got a fun personal question here for you. So the question is, Javier, are you naturally at ease with critters? If not, how did you become so adept and comfortable handling them? Oh my gosh. I love that question. Thank you. That's for a good one. Question. Um, so there's no forced temperament here on my side, right? I'm not kind of like pushing through some innate fear. Uh, I have definitely been a critter guy since I can remember. So as far back as I've known. Um, so no, no, no fear overall. I've always really just appreciated um, the smaller things in life, you know, all the creepy crawlies around and I find them to be really fascinating. Right. And I also feel that people that 
um, are letting their fear get in the way of appreciating them are really missing out because they're mm. such incredible animals. So even if you are scared, Ryan and I appreciate you joining us today so much to learn more about these animals and really get up close, even if it's virtually, just so you can get a set better sense of how amazing they truly are. That's fantastic. We got follow up question to that. Someone while you're answering it says they have loved animals since they were three years old and they are now seven years old. So once Amazing. you start, you kind of can't stop loving animals. Ooh, I've got a speed based question here for you real quick that I'm a little curious about myself, too, just based off of humans. Does this one is specific to the turtle, but I'm going to kind of bring it into all the animals. And our friend is curious if does age affect the speed of turtles? Can that be then in all of our animals? Do the younger animals move faster than the older animals? Or does it take them time to kind of develop their skills a little bit as adolescents and then really grow into their bodies as they get older? Or are they just like hyper and all over the place like little toddlers of humans? Man, we are getting the best questions today. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so I would definitely say, like pretty much any living organism, right? There's a point where they're in their prime, right? And as they get older, they definitely start to get a little bit slower, right? Um, a lot of us probably have pets around. We've seen that with their older age, they're just not as spry. They're not able to really move as fast as they once were. So I think that really applies across the animal kingdom, including our turtle, including pretty much all of our animals, right? The older they are, the slower they tend to be. But a lot of animals hatch out and have to be fast, right? When we think about sea turtles along the, um, the beaches, when they hatch out, they got to get to that water fast because there's lots of predators out there trying to get them. So there's definitely animals that build up their way to be the fastest, but as they get older, they tend to be much, much slower. Yeah. No, that seems about right. All right. Javier, I have a few more questions for you here, but before we wrap up, I'm going to throw the toughest question that you've had to answer all day at you. You ready for this one? Go for it. What's your favorite animal that you take care of at the museum? Oh, oh I told you it was going to be a tough one, Javier. Why you do this to me, Ryan? <laughs> oh my gosh. There's so many great animals. Right? Honestly. As long as they're not in earshot, right? You don't want to make the other ones feel jealous of whatever maybe your favorite is. Yeah. Honestly, there's there's so many great animals here. And I think that, you know, we have to appreciate them all and take care of them all equally. Um, I think that having access to them is really, really unique because no matter how much I learn about the animals, there's always more to learn. That's what's really, really incredible, right? Even today, some of these questions that I've got today, I was like, huh, I've never thought of it that way. That makes me want to go out and learn more. And there's always, always, always more to learn. But as far as if I really had to pick, right? Um, maybe not so much that it's my favorite personally, but just one of the ones that I think is really unique and pretty cool. Um, our vinegaroon, right? Which is a type of arachnid. We didn't show it today, mm -hmm. but hopefully we'll have it in future programs. Is such a unique invertebrate and it's such a strange looking invertebrate and people tend to react to it. So, so kind of like with just not really understanding what it is, but I really love that, right? Our box turtle, our frog, all of the animals here in the museum are fantastic. We love each and every one of them, but there's something special about seeing that vinegaroon and having somebody say like, I have never in my life seen mm -hmm. something like that. So I really love um, seeing people's reactions to that. And that's probably gonna be the, the closest I have to a favorite. Same thing for me as well. I usually like to, my favorites, which is really tough, but are usually those really unique or different or they have something really special. Oh, they're just so far different from a human that is just bizarre to me. And those are the things I think are really neat. Totally. So our friend who has been loving animals since she was three and is now seven also does agree with you. She has no favorite animal and she loves them all, even though her friends keep asking uh, asking what's the favorite. She doesn't has favorites all over the place. All right. Well, thank you so much, Javier. It looks like we are reaching the end of our program today. Uh, it looks like that's all we've got, but 
Let's give a big hand for Javier and all of the animals today. Javier, would you like to say anything to the folks at home before we take off? I just like always want to say thank you so much for joining us. We love having you here. We hope that you appreciate the animals as much as we do. And we hope you learned something as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for attending this edition of After School Animal Encounters. And be sure to keep your eyes open for more to come. And have a great day, everybody.